The Bible has a lot to say about manipulation. Using examples, principles, and commands, the Bible warns us to not manipulate others and to not allow others to manipulate us. Galatians 5, 20 to 26 calls it a work of the flesh, and it says idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God, which means you won't go to heaven. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So to manipulate, by definition, is to negotiate, control, or influence for one's personal advantage. And spiritual manipulation is high wickedness, and it's used by some abusive churches and cults to control individuals and use those under their control as a means of gain. So it's basically using those that you're to care for as a shepherd cares for sheep where they are the priceless part of that equation, it would mean using them for your own personal gain. And while doing that, causing them to think that this is conduct that is from the Bible. That is manipulation in a spiritual sense. This also would include often hidden agendas and deception as to what the true purpose really is of that church or ministry. There is something else going on there besides the church of Jesus Christ. It's, it's a different agenda that will be kept hidden. Another priority, another mission. Revelation 21.8 says, But as for the cowards and the unbelieving and the abominable, which is those who lack good character and integrity, or they practice and tolerate sexual immorality and murderers and sorcerers, that's the ones who do witchcraft, and idolaters, that's those who have something more important to them in their life than Jesus. The way to know what's most important to you would be to look at your schedule and look at your, your bank um, sheet because what you give your time and your money to that is your God and occultists who practice and teach false religions which many are in the Christian field of work and all liars who knowingly deceive and twist the truth their part will be in a lake that blazes with fire and brimstone which is the second death that's what the Bible says the Bible is clear in warning us against witchcraft because it's a perverse anointing from the devil. It is something that has been taken and twisted. Witchcraft allows strong confusion to come into our minds and against our thinking so that Jesus, our mission, our purpose, they all become derailed and we don't ever land where we're supposed to be because we become clouded by the witchcraft. We are then vulnerable to the distractions and temptations that the enemy is always bringing to us because of the confusion. We have a responsibility to know about this as spiritual wickedness and to guard ourselves from it. And the Bible is very clear about it. It goes into great detail about this deception and witchcraft. I think the problem is, is most people don't read it. They associate witchcraft with Wiccans, witches, they don't realize that it's incredibly prevalent in people's lives. Manipulators intentionally and deceitfully conceal important information from those they are trying to control. Witchcraft itself is intensely emotional and it's a spiritual activity and the activities of witchcraft impact your emotions, but also your physical and your spiritual condition. And for a Christian, manipulation means 
attempting to gain control of someone or your circumstances or some kind of circumstances using unbiblical ways by stirring up an emotional reaction rather than a biblical response. And the term used in the Bible of this type of person who does this is called an oppressor. Most are deceived because they don't think that this could be them or anyone around them. They think it's about practicing rituals, doing sorcery, putting spells on people. But the truth is just being controlled or controlling others by your own emotions qualifies as witchcraft to God. And it also, with that practice, brings a demon of witchcraft into you. And when we're doing prayer ministry, I don't even... There are so few that don't have that. We almost always see a witchcraft demon. And these are even in ministry leaders that we see witchcraft devils that will flare up because of this type of situation. That no one calls it out because so many people do it. They don't want it to be called out for what it is. But it's such high wickedness against the kingdom of God that I'm addressing it, not because I'm innocent, but because it's so dangerous to eternity that many people, if they don't know and turn, will not only go, probably lose their own eternity to hell, but they will take people with them who have no idea that this is even ex existing. It needs to be talked about because the Bible talks about it. When we are controlled and led by the Spirit and not by our emotions, we walk in joy peace and righteousness. We live in the spirit or we live in our emotions. There's no other way to do it. There's one or the other. We are to get our focus off of ourself, our emotions, and we are to always focus on the good of others. If we're looking at others to search out the bad, that's a wrong focus on others. The key to not practicing witchcraft and reaping the eternal consequences for doing so is to not follow and be ruled by our emotions. Because when you choose that, pride is your God. Pride is the doorkeeper of witchcraft. There are no other options. Pride is the core sin of Satan. When you come under someone's emotions, someone else's, you are under witchcraft. When you're serving someone's emotions, you're under witchcraft. And sadly, both of these, those who keep people under control using witchcraft and those who come under control are gonna need to break company with that or their eternity is at stake because they are not under the Holy Spirit. Both of these do not stand to inherit the kingdom of God, which is joy, peace, and righteousness, and God is the one who says it. You are under a different spirit. Don't assume differently because you're sure that you won't go to hell, because many people have said that and have gone lost because they didn't read the Bible. They didn't read what it really said, and this is what it says. So the emotions we were given, God did create emotions, he wanted us to pursue him. He wanted us to be able to repent, to feel remorse. He wanted us to have emotions for healthy reasons. He never intended for our emotions to control others or to manipulate people to get what we want. Manipulation is actually lying. And when someone speaks to deceive, they're being manipulative because to deceive is to manipulate someone into thinking or behaving a certain way. So everything that's in the Bible for warnings and consequences for lying can also be applied to manipulation. And lying is a dreadful sin and a lifestyle of doing so leads to hell for eternity according to God. Satan himself is the father of lies and he's the master of manipulation. He manipulated Eve, the first woman, with half-truths and appeals to her desire for wisdom. That's how he got her deceived. She dis disobeyed God. Satan still manipulates people into traps that he sets for them. 2 Corinthians 11:14 says he masquerades as an angel of light, so he doesn't come in a demonic form to most people. It's something incredibly appealing. 
He knows and plays on our weaknesses, our pride, and he convinces us that following a sinful path that he has clearly laid out in a very beautiful, enticing way is our best option at the time. He has many tricks that he uses to bring us under his control. He has no care if we believe he exists or not. He just needs us to follow after him. Christians are never to engage in manipulation or to take advantage of others in any way. Ephesians 4.25 says, Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. We also should never allow ourselves to be manipulated. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 16, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves, meaning don't be taken advantage of and don't manipulate other people. Some people by nature are more manipulative than others. They have strong wills, they have strong personalities, and they can use their personalities to seduce trust from people. Everyone needs to be very careful when dealing with this type of person, especially when they're inside your family, because trust is critically important in relationships that will work. We have to be able to speak the truth in love and we need to be able to expect the same from others. First Thessalonians 4, 6 says, and that in this matter, no one should wrong his brother, brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. Romans 16, 18 says, For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty says, In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or pushes himself forward or slaps you in the face. 2 Corinthians 11, 13, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. Leviticus 25, 17 says, do not take advantage of each other, but fear God. I am the Lord your God. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. Proverbs 21, 6, a fortune made by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a deadly snare. We actually had someone confess recently that they had made a great fortune in their life. They felt by not being honest, it was really bothering them at this point in their life that they had not done it by honest means. Matthew seven fifteen. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. We have one safe place and that is to put our emotions under control of the Holy Spirit. And the problem is that many are slaves to their own emotions. It doesn't matter how many songs you sing in worship, it doesn't matter how many messages you preach yourself in a church, Maturity is reached by bringing your emotions under the control of the Holy Spirit. That is how maturity happens spiritually, not by your giftings, not by your abilities. It is by bringing yourself under subjection to the Holy Spirit. When we allow our emotions to lead us, we release witchcraft onto ourselves and onto those around us. I'm going to read that again. When we allow our emotions to lead us, we release witchcraft onto ourselves and onto those around us. Sean Rosiger writes, people do emotional witchcraft because of their unhealed wounds from their past. If you let your wounds affect you, your wounds are going to affect others. If you let your wounds affect you, you are not obtaining the benefits of the cross. Past hurts, unforgiveness, and past wounds will cause you to be attached to your own emotions and then you will operate through them. You will try to attach people to them as well. You must heal in your body, but also in your soul and mind, or you will be practicing witchcraft all day long, emotional witchcraft. You won't even realize that you're doing it. That's why victims attract other victims. Victims and hurt people hang out and find other hurt people because there is an agreement and a familiar spirit between them. Together, they feel comfortable because they have one in the same, similar past, they understand each other, Rather than common ministry desires, they bond and click over past situations, past wounds, past common sins, past things that are not to be mentioned in the, 
once we start walking with Jesus. They bond over the sin, not their future endeavors for the kingdom. The witchcraft we start doing to one another, we generally do it completely through emotional means. That's the most common way. And some examples of emotional witchcraft are crying like a child is emotional witchcraft. Through crying, people feel they will get what they want from the person that they're trying to get it from. Nagging to get your way is another way. We should and cannot pay attention to it or be under it. People start this as a child and if it's not stopped, they take nagging into their marriage. This is witchcraft. Flattering, manipulating people through kindness, seduction and temptation. You're trying to be nice to them so that they won't tell you no or so that you can get what you want from them. That is witchcraft. Anger. People intimidate others through anger by making them walk on eggshells, allowing no discussion of whatever it is that they're the issue at hand. And people aren't allowed to express their opinion about it. It's locked down. When anger is used in that way to control that way, it is witchcraft. Guilt. Making the other feel guilty about their own choices is witchcraft. Giving up in the sense that you cause another to come after you, seeking your attention to try to resolve whatever it is, manipulation and witchcraft. Becoming stoic, showing no emotion, trying to control the atmosphere by making others feel self-conscious about having fun or not having fun or feeling some certain way. For liking someone that you don't like, this silent control is witchcraft. But so is smirking and rolling your eyes acting like a victim, always living from a place of defeat because yesterday had mistakes, failures, things happened to you. To live in that identity when you're claiming to be in Christ falls under witchcraft. We have victory in Jesus and we should be living accordingly. He withholds nothing from us to heal. Jonas Clark lists 10 signs also of emotional witchcraft. They play the role of the victim. It's never their fault. Their failures are the blame of someone else. They are blame shifters. Instead of taking accountability, they shift the blame to others. When the person is confronted, they move to silent treatment. They remain silent until they are ready to talk. They're double-minded. This person cannot make a decision and they look to you or someone else for all of their decision-making. They are unstable and they look to others to provide their stability. They cannot stand alone. They need validation from others to feel accepted, so they cannot be alone. Woe is me is normally their story. Everyone's attacking them, out to sabotage them. They're always the victim of that. They're easily offended, and because their issues are never at fault, they are sealed in pride. This person will give and take, meaning they will provide you with information, but they will withdraw as soon as you disagree with them such as, never mind, forget I asked, forget I ever said anything. That's what they will say. They become narcissistic, always wondering, what's in this for me? Why aren't you into me like I'm into myself? Can't you see who I am? This person is self-aware, but with the inability to see others, it is all about them all the time. A few other indicators, rather than accepting your no, a manipulator will wear you down. They will keep working on you and will keep working on you to wear you down until you say yes. They will not stop trying to get their way even when you clearly tell them no. They will, they will even act like they accept your no, but they will still work on you to wear you down to change your mind. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility count others more important than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. A manipulator does the exact opposite of this. Rather than considering others are more important, they will always consider their needs to be the most important, more so than anyone else. And there's times when we do need to compromise and do things for someone that we don't really want to do. But if it's always one-sided and it's always one-sided for someone specific and not you, your relationship is likely with a manipulator. A manipulator will use guilt and shame as a weapon to control you. They have a powerful ability to find your weakness and use it to gain control over you. 
same with secrets. If they know a secret about you, they'll always power over you with that secret. Threaten you for exposure. Manipulators intentionally search out people who are struggling with shame, guilt, and low self-esteem because they know they can manipulate them because of those things. The Bible talks about the people who work on weak-willed women, that kind of people. It isn't just men that do that. It, women do that plenty. If someone is using shame and guilt to control you, this is a classic sign of a manipulator. A manipulator risks letting you have other healthy friendships in your life or any relationships for that matter. They need to keep you captive by lies and fear and they want to keep your view of reality just twisted enough so that you will always see them as the final authority on everything. They'll be overly protective of who you spend time with and they will actually forbid that you talk to anyone that they feel is a threat to their control over you. People from the outside will easily be able to see the manipulation so the manipulator will try to keep you away from those people who might warn you about the abuse that they're seeing in this relationship. The Bible says we need each other so we can correct one another when we're not seeing things clearly. So if someone is trying to prevent you from spending time with other people who love you and who want the best for you, it is a very good indicator that you are dealing with a manipulator and you are under the control of witchcraft meaning you are not under the Holy Spirit. We stop being under the spell of witchcraft of others by not tolerating it. The power that we give in the spirit realm through our emotions is incredibly strong. We make a choice to hand ourselves over to the control of others. This is not accidental. This is an agreement. You make a choice to change who you submit to. This is a choice that determines heaven or hell forever for most people. I have been in and I know plenty of people who are in battering relationships. Men or women, doesn't matter, goes both ways. But the person who's a victim, not in all cases, because some cases it is dangerous, and I'm not even talking about the, how hard that is to get away from, but in most cases, we cannot get the female away from the male. I don't work on getting males away from females, but so I can't speak for that side, but she, there's something in that that she wants bad enough that she will stay and often instigate a fight to get it. So there's agreement in being underneath the control of another oftentimes. Sometimes it's financial, sometimes, many times it's actually financial. Sometimes it's um, fame. People want to be with someone that brings attention to them. All emotional witchcraft is wickedness and sin against God. You have to bring your emotions under control or your emotions will control you and you will control others through that. We have to learn to deal with our feelings so we can make rational and deliberate choices. And Jesus, when he would preach, he would give a clear choice and then he would let the Holy Spirit do the work. He never forced or controlled an agenda. We are in this body, current state. We are moved by five senses. But once we are born again into God's kingdom, we are to live by spiritual senses. Satan's plan from the beginning of time was to destroy us through sin. So when we become born again, we're to put our flesh to death. That means don't feed it. The sinful nature is to not be fed. It keeps us from becoming who God created us to be. It opens the door for the devil to attack our lives, our homes, our families, our work, everything. It also, if you become saved and you do not part with your sin, your salvation will not even come to fruition. You cannot call yourself saved if you never repented of and turned from your sin. You were not saved if you have not done that. Our flesh becomes God and our emotions rule us and we become unprofitable for the kingdom of God. And that, he says, with, without corresponding works, not that works save us, but without corresponding works, our faith is dead. We serve the opposite kingdom in that case. And what's most terrible is that we had an amazing Savior who left heaven came down to earth in the lowliest of possible circumstances in his life. 
gave his life literally in the most severe, atrocious, terrible way to pay for all of our sin. And then he was raised from the dead and the power that raised him from the dead broke open graves all around him and a bunch more people were raised from the dead too from that power because they walked into the town. God says we have the power that raised Jesus from the dead available to us if we ask. So there will be no excuse for anyone who claims to be a born again Christian who no one can tell that they are born again, that they are a follower of Jesus. There's no excuse for that, zero, because we have the power that raised Jesus from the dead available to us. If you don't have it in, at work in your life, there's only one reason for that. You have not sought after it. He's not, he's not trying to hold it back from us. He wants to give it. We need the power of the gospel to change our minds because if our minds change, our soul is changed and healed. That's how the soul is changed, by the healing of the mind. And that's done by bringing it under submission to the Word of God. Because emotions were meant to be good. God gave them to us, but never to tear down others. It was always to build His kingdom. We are to build with Him. Wounded people cannot preach the true gospel because they fear man. And this is what happens when people don't get healed and they put themselves out there as a mouthpiece or work in a ministry or somehow they put themselves in a position where they represent Jesus Christ and they're not healed. The devil takes over their thinking. They share a very neutered, watered down version of what is meant to be a very solid message. Sometimes they'll even preach a hard truth but it's not a critical truth. The critical truths are what is sin, simply living for yourself is sin, that repentance is required for you to go to heaven. That means you have to turn from living for yourself. That most people are going to hell according to the Bible, which is certainly not believed by the masses. They think most people go to heaven. That is not true. And because most don't read their Bibles and they don't know that their pastor isn't preaching the solid truth of the gospel, very few pastors are addressing sin for what it really is. Very few pastors are telling those in their congregation that if they're addicted to porn and they're living sexually immoral, they are not going to heaven. Very few pastors are telling people that if you aren't walking in the Spirit, following the Holy Spirit in this life, you cannot call yourself a child of the living God because the Holy Spirit is God and we have to be following Him. If we're not following the Holy Spirit, we're not full of the Holy Spirit, we're different. We have a different spirit in us and it is not of God and it will not go to heaven. Love is not led by emotion. When we love one another and when we don't let someone's emotion power over us, only then will we be helpful to others. We must love Jesus and others enough to boldly declare the full truth of the gospel, not the parts that are comfortable for us, the bold truth of the gospel. We are to stand in righteousness and not under the power of our emotions and not under fear that people are going to hate us and despise us for sharing the truth because they did that to Jesus, they did that to the disciples, that is part of what is expected when you share the truth, that people are not going to like you, and especially the religious people. They are the meanest of all. 1 Corinthians 10.23 and 1 Corinthians 6.12 both say, All things are lawful to me, but all things do not profit. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. There are three main ways that indicate the practice of rebellion, which is witchcraft. They are manipulation, intimidation, and domination. And whenever you see one of these being used, an act of rebellion called witchcraft is being committed. They cast a spell and a person's free will is violated. Manipulation is probably the most subtle 
Different from persuasion, it works to override a person's decision. Persuasion will try to change your mind. Manipulation causes you to do something you would not normally do. People use guilt, fear, humiliation, sympathy to get someone to do something that they would not otherwise do. They would report something like, they made me feel so guilty that I dot, 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 did what they wanted. That is manipulation. This predatorial type person will also play on the sympathy of someone to manipulate them. When someone intentionally uses another person's compassion as a means to manipulate them to complying with their plan, that is witchcraft. All red flags up when someone is telling you that you should be doing something or that you owe them something. And this is oftentimes manipulation, which is witchcraft, which is from the side of hell inspired by the devil himself. Many Christians even use the Bible to manipulate other people. They show you a verse, they present it out of context to prove to you that you should be obeying what they're telling you to do. This is the problem. If you don't know the Bible for yourself, you will easily fall under this. The Holy Spirit never uses force or pressure. He always suggests or convicts and lets you make your own decision. John 16, 18 says, when he comes, the Spirit, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. If the Holy Spirit is alive in you, living in you, which is the result of being born again, you will have clarity on all the things that I'm saying because you have the Spirit in you that opposes all of these spirits and He will immediately warn you when they are present. Intimidation is a major form of witchcraft. Intimidation often comes in the form of bullying or threats. And just because someone can push someone else around, whether physically, emotionally, financially, or otherwise, does not mean they have the authority to make someone obey their commands. This is, God hates that behavior. Many who possess strong and dominant personalities stray from a natural, what is meant to be a great gift of being a leader, into this wicked practice of intimidation. They have become prideful. They want to have control. They don't want anything around them taking a lead. They often seem intimidating just because their personalities get so big and so forceful. They walk around as if they're wearing a crown or carrying a club. They have this presence that goes with them that is a spirit, but not the Holy Spirit. They abuse their gift and deliberately intimidate others into submission to their desires. They have become a missionary for the side of the devil at that point. When people just submit because they feel that presence and they know don't mess with that, it would be very wise for those who are like that to step completely away from whatever roles they're in to go humbly submit themselves to a leader that is walking out Christianity according to the Bible, repent, humble themselves, and serve. Because that's what a leader does. That's what a true leader does. They serve and they build up. They don't tear down. Oftentimes, the greatest wreckage to try to fix in a person's life has been done from the example set by a leader in ministries because the person thinks they can't do wrong and that they're of God automatically they think that by their identity and by the role that they're in and so there is no choice for that person but to feel wrong crushed, defeated, lost, and oftentimes they become shamed by the, the whole community that is involved. This will all get sorted out. We see judgment fall on a lot of these leaders before they even pass into eternity. If God is merciful, that's what will happen. 
He will bring them to their knees in repentance this side of heaven because if he doesn't and he lets them go into eternity that same way, they will be lost. So hopefully they will heed the warnings being hurled at them. They will have to acknowledge the true Holy Spirit, however. But anyone who abuses in that way is in great danger for eternity. Domination is probably the most obvious of the main styles of emotional witchcraft. This occurs oftentimes in criminal violence. Other forms of domination would occur in domestic abuse and employer bullying an employee, using date rape drugs, any abuse of authority that forces someone to comply with an abuser's demands. There's no excuse for bullying in any setting. I've been in positions of leading. I know how frustrating it can become, but I also know that I have stayed as close to Jesus as I can in all of those things. And I also felt, I felt the grief that I caused him when I did that. There is no time that God wants people to be torn down and have another human make them feel worse about themselves than he would ever do. We are, if we are granted a position of leading in any, any way, the expectation from God is that we honor them. We can correct in honor. We can discipline in honor. We can communicate in honor. All of it can be done in honor. There is no time he allows for it to be destructive. The reason why I say that is because so many of our calls come in from people who have been deeply wounded by the communication from someone in ministry leadership. Anytime someone forces their will onto someone else, leaving them with absolutely no other choice, that is domination and witchcraft. We cannot confuse actual authority with illegitimate authority, however. Genuine authority attempts to persuade through the presenting of facts. Illegitimate authority works to manipulate in order to get its own way and override someone else's choice. Genuine authority is a strong leader with influence. Illegitimate authority is a bully who intimidates in order to make someone submit to what they want from them. And that can be done vocally or non-vocally. You can be a complete bully without ever saying anything. Your nature is, can be bullying. If the devil inside of a person can get you thinking mostly about yourself, your own dreams, your purposes, your ministry, your plans, then it gets you away from what God's trying to do. You can even build a large church, a large ministry, and the devil is happy to help you build it. He's built many of them. He loves placing his best deceivers, his false prophets, in lead roles in ministry. And how do you know? You look at their fruit. If they produce converts who are humble, seeking holiness, seeking purity, working in discipleship, desiring discipleship, so they're studying the Bible and learning what it says, they're, they've left sin and all selfish living, all the while helping others to find Jesus. You have a genuine ambassador of Christ in the leadership. Read the fruit and you can see the, who is leading. Just read the fruit and then you will know what is leading. Be on guard against emotional manipulation and all unusual efforts by anyone to force their way into your life. Some of the signs of emotional ma manipulation after it's entered our confusion, we're unable to focus. It's all intended to get control of a person by destabilizing their thinking. Witchcraft is meant to attack our peace 
and as a trade, it gives us confusion. And you're suddenly experiencing chaos and turmoil in various levels of your life. One of the most dangerous uses of this demonic tool is a conversation between Christians where one will say, the Lord told me that dot, dot, dot. This statement stops the conversation because it implies that since God has spoken a word, there's no further discussion on the matter. And do not be fooled by this wickedness. It is spiritual manipulation and it is not from God. Or if a minister says, give or sow seed into my ministry and God will repay you 100 times, 1,000 times, 7.4 times, sow and you will reap, that is also spiritual manipulation because God is no man's debtor. This angers God and it will end up in a whirlwind of judgment if uh, it's not repented of and amends are not made. It is straight up theft from others and oftentimes very vulnerable people. Amends are gonna need to be made. And for those who say that the Lord spoke and you're speaking to someone else, I, I can't even count on, I can't even begin to count how many times that has happened to me when I was, when I first um, moved up to the city, my first year up here, I had three men tell me that God told them that I was their wife. Three men in one year. And I learned quickly to be incredibly turned off by that behavior because I thought, I mean, I never thought, I, I would think that if somebody was supposed to be my husband, I would have some kind of desire to even have a conversation with them. but. They were pretty forceful in their delivery and, and their subsequent multiple attempts to deliver that message. It, it's just mind boggling how many people use that method. God told me, the Lord shared with me, the Lord showed me about someone else. All in an attempt to gain something from them. Another form of spiritual manipulation happens when abusive churches and ministries twist the Bible to give more authority to the leader and to keep members under control. They often use Hebrews 13, 17 that says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who might give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that will be of no benefit to you. This is the proof that they show you in the Bible that allows them to demand complete loyalty and obedience to themselves by you. Some view even questioning them as an offense so serious that you have questioned God himself. Some claim to have superior authority and approval from God and to disobey them equals disobeying God. They say things like, touch not my anointed. And this is perhaps one of the most harmful forms of spiritual manipulation. It is not found in the true church of Jesus Christ. The victims and heresies that come from this are endless. And these leaders have a terrible day of reckoning ahead if they do not repent and turn and make amends. Victims of spiritual manipulation seldom realize what's even happening to them because they're under this heavy thumb that threatens them with hell if they don't obey. Here are some indicators of a spiritually manipulative church or ministry. There's a system of legalism that stresses obedience apart from intimacy with Jesus Christ. They demand obedience. There's humiliation for the disobedient. There's unquestioning submission expected. And there's punishment, which equals loss of privileges, shunning, expulsion, ex exploitation for those who don't. There's misplaced loyalty. It's to man and not to God. The emphasis is often on performance. Exclu exclusivism, they believe they are right and everyone else is wrong. And they also have a system of isolation from other same, same type things. They have a refusal to associate with anyone except their type. So you will see 
ministries line up with other ministries that sort of have the same kind of system. Abusive churches teach members to block out any critical information that could actually free them or show them what's happening. With incoming information controlled, leaders can get and keep control of their people. Spiritually abusive ministries have a misplaced sense of loyalty. It is actually demanded. The loyalty is not to Jesus first, it is to an organization, church, or leader. That is witchcraft. This is enforced by setting up a system where disloyalty or disagreement with the leader is viewed as disobeying God and questioning leaders is not allowed. The leader is the authority and the authority is always right. This is outrageous as spiritual manipulation because it denies the truth of Ephesians 1.22 that says that only Jesus is the head of the church. Our loyalty is due to him alone. If the spiritual leadership of the ministry or church you are part of is truly in right order, they expect your loyalty to be to Jesus. They expect you to hold them to that loyalty also. Any ministry that prevents its members from doing their own research, research or from challenging what the leader says has something to hide and something to fear. Religion, which is actually an antichrist spirit, religion opposes God, operates in the realm of the flesh and by emotions att attempts to obtain salvation. And Satan is the father of religion. When someone is afraid to speak correction, that means that the person is under emotional witchcraft because they already know what the reaction will be if they dare to say it. And they choose not to challenge it because they know what will happen. They already know the spirit they're under is not the Holy Spirit unless they're deceived about God themselves. They have not read the Bible for themselves and they actually think that abuser on the top is the Holy Spirit. That's the biggest lie of all. When you don't speak because of fear of someone's reaction, you have put yourself under emotional witchcraft. It's your choice. You can't blame anyone. It's your choice. For whatever reason you choose to stay under it, that is also your choice. You are now under the spiritual authority of a demon. And when you use your emotions as a way to stop someone from telling you the truth, you're also practicing emotional witchcraft. When you tell people they can't say to you that, or they can't challenge you. It's a willing partnership with the devil himself led by pride, which is his core characteristic. This is why Satan does not want you to confront yourself, anyone else. He doesn't want anyone confronted. He wants everyone kept in this bondage because hell will be more full if he can. You need to consider if it's really worth it to stay under witchcraft when the cost is going to be so high at the end. The woman at the well was confronted by Jesus in John 4, 4 through 26. Jesus went straight to the point. He was not afraid of how she was going to react. And that's exactly how we are supposed to be. We have to be free to preach as Jesus preached, straight to the truth. We're not responsible for the reactions. But when those who practice emotional witchcraft are corrected, they react poorly, they get angry, they get mad, they feel exposed. They will hide from you or charge at you. They put up walls, they shut you out, they banish you, they block you. You either honor them or they will not tolerate you. Jesus said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He gives us rest, he is gentle, and he's humble in heart, according to Matthew 11, 28 through 29. That's how those who shepherd for Jesus look. And if your shepherd or your ministry or church leader does not resemble this, I would get out because your life is blocked of so many blessings if you choose to stay. You have to determine that you, yourself, by an act of your own will, are going to stop practicing witchcraft. This is an act of repentance and it's the only way to get free. You cannot force anyone else to stop trying to influence you with witchcraft. 
because if you do, then you're back to practicing witchcraft, but you can resist them. And the Bible does give you permission to do that. In James 4, 7, the Bible says to resist the devil and he will flee from you to this behavior. The devil is behind it. So refuse to be manipulated, refuse to be intimidated and refuse to be dominated. You're doing the word if you do those things, but you should and can pray for the offender. Pray that God will draw them to himself so that they may experience genuine salvation and get set free from their bondage to witchcraft. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to repentance. And that includes those who are bullying others through witchcraft. Second Peter 3, 9. Sometimes we have to separate ourselves from those that continue to operate in witchcraft. And when the offending person is a close relative or your spouse or with in your household, you should make every effort to save the relationship and defeat the witchcraft before separating yourself from them. I would, I would involve other people. I would do, try to hold the family together. Rather, 2 Corinthians 4, 2 says, rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. In summary, many are under severe demonic attacks and they are unaware that witchcraft spirits are at work governing their lives. And the enemy will not leave alone those who are being used by God. So as a believer, you need to always be aware of this and always staying free from entanglements and sin. Any door you open, the devil's gonna charge through. We all know that. But threats, Fits of rage, anger, wrath, temper tantrums, violence, bullying, silent treatment, crying, alienation, deflection, slander, triangulation, abandonment, manipulative crying. These are all forms of control designed to destroy the life and ministry of a child of God. It is all the work of Satan. The person using witchcraft makes others feel bad through the guilt to control them, to twist the truth, and to make the victim feel like the abuser. They will accuse you of being the abuser. In public, everyone tends to like these people. They're amazing, they're charismatic, they look powerful. You look crazy to suggest that they're abusing you. You may even doubt yourself in most cases. I have been there. If you have to resort to manipulation for a desired outcome, most likely the desired outcome is wrong. Even if the desired outcome is not necessarily sinful, the willingness to sin for it has now placed it in idolatry. It is now witchcraft. So stop allowing people to speak evil over your life because they are upset with you and want to control your life. Put them out. Many have connected to these spirits because they did not seek God and they ran after the gifts of the false prophets and the apostles they ran after a paycheck, they ran after a position, they ran after recognition, they ran after a gifting, but for some reason, they put themselves in this position by choice. And most of the warfare coming against many is because they have entertained this sin in others and they have sowed into them, which is a form of a covenant and a connection with the evil that they are now partnered with. It is not an accident. Unless they're a small child, children, this is not even about that. This is about adults. You cannot blame anyone else. If you read your Bible, you will see that this is wickedness, that God will not tolerate it, and he holds each person accountable. You must repent and renounce your agreements with all evil works so that the resulting bondage will be broken from you. You need to look around at the people that are around you and if they are walking and practicing this type of behavior, it is up to you to leave. God isn't going to make, he isn't going to tell you, pray that their hearts will be changed so you can stay. You need to leave, pray that their hearts will be changed. Don't be lazy. I wouldn't wait because with truth comes responsibility. Pray and seek God for yourself Many in ministry roles have secret sins of which they won't repent and get delivered from. 
It's easy for them to hide in ministry. It's easy for them to overpower people. If they were in a corporate job, they wouldn't get away with it. But it's very easy for them to be in these ministry roles. They can go clear to the top with very little accountability and they can get to the top and have no accountability. The end result of these leaders who behave this way towards others is an eternal lake of fire that burns forever. They will answer for every single offense they committed. That is why it is urgent that we pray for those who offend us because their end is going to be terrible if this is a lifestyle that they lead and operate out of. If they don't lead and act like Jesus Christ, they're not of him. Jesus Christ never manipulates us to achieve his and our purpose. He never treats us as if we're objects. He always treats people with dignity. You can ask God to show you how you are led by your emotions, your past wounds, and whatever else you're using to manipulate and control people. Our flesh once had dominion and power over us, but Jesus changed that. If you're born again, you are not allowed to walk after the flesh. It's not, it is not something that is allowed. If you can walk according to the flesh and not feel absolutely in despair over it, you are not saved. Those who get caught in, in sin for a time are so incredibly broken and miserable over it, they don't stay in it. That is saved. It is not that we don't sin, it is that we don't stay in our sin. We run to our people and we get ourselves right with God. If we love him, we will obey him. He says that. We are still able to walk in the flesh, but we don't have to and we should never choose to. Once God heals our soul, our mind and emotions, we start walking after the spirit. And when we think after the flesh now, it produces death to our spirit. You will not stay with God. There's no way to live in peace and please God if you live after the flesh. Confusion is going to come over your mind. We're called to be children led by the spirit of God, not by emotion. Those that are led by emotion and by their flesh do not please God. They should not call themselves of God. When Jesus was on his way to the cross, he was in agony in the garden, but he did not use that agony to make others feel bad for him. He used that agony to glorify his father. His emotions pushed him to seek God even more. He was praying. His emotions gave him more passion to do what he came here to do, and that was to die for me and for everyone who would have him. When Jesus was at the temple, the scene everyone brings up where Jesus apparently lost control of himself, he let his emotions become visible, but they were led by the Spirit of God. He did not react by his feelings or the situation. They did not govern his behavior. He put all under the word of God and he made a choice. He never sinned. He whipped the floor. He never touched a person. If he would have touched a person or gone after a person, that would have been sin but he was not controlled by his emotions. He had them, but he did not let them control him. His father and he together controlled his emotions through some incredibly horrible things that happened before he went to heaven. And he made the right judgment by demonstrating and chasing out all who bought and sold in his temple. Without any manipulation or control, he simply said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. He stated it. Ours should also be a house of prayer. Our personal temple, our home, our church should be a house of prayer. When you're free, nothing can bother you because you are dead to your flesh and your feelings. Can you even imagine that? That would be so amazing. If you're dead to them, you're not being controlled by them. This is what the work of the cross offers us. That your feelings do not have the last word and that we do not have to be controlled by them. That's what the cross did for us. This is why one of the fruits of the spirit is self-control. In Galatians 5, to 23, 
We need to stop letting our emotions rule us so that we can be effective and everything possible in the kingdom of God. It is up to us to plunder hell. The kingdom of Satan will get stronger every time we feed our flesh and we're guided by our emotions. And this is why when people always bring up that, I do what I don't want to do, that verse in their defense, do you know why they do that? Because they are led by their emotions. That's why they do that. There is no excuse in that. It is simply being led by emotion. Now that we're under grace, God gives us the power to overcome our emotions and the fruits are evident for others to see. And by that, they will come to know and believe in the power of the cross. Seek deliverance from witchcraft. Witchcraft is a work of the flesh and we're called to repent and no longer walk after the lust of the flesh. The Holy Spirit must lead us at all times and God is destroying the works of witchcraft and removing the burden of false responsibility and all the other horrendous burdens that it has placed on many people. Ask God to search your heart and to deliver you from the power of witchcraft, whether it's you using it over others or you coming under it from others or both. Get free of witchcraft. Ephesians 6, 13 through 17 says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god the price paid for us to be free from our sin was astonishing it seems to far, far surpass anything that seems th thinkable actually the crucifixion was a terrible event I never want anyone who has met me or who has listened to me to have to face Jesus and say, I, I just didn't take it serious or I didn't, I just didn't think it was that serious. I didn't like that rigid preaching. I'm begging everyone. Don't cheapen Jesus. Don't cheapen Jesus and do not cheapen his prize, which is people. Every one of them was worth Jesus to him. So every person you meet, God sent Jesus and he died for that person. And he's the one who will judge you on how you treated them. Jesus himself will. I have learned the hard way to go back and clean up messes that I made because I know that I hurt people. And now I'm more careful about that. And when I see the impact I've had on a person, if at all possible, I will ask them to forgive me and I will try to restate what I meant to say without adding judgment, discouragement, defeat, abandonment, rejection. I don't ever want to be known as the person who caused another to say, I want nothing to do with Jesus or Christians. I never want to be that person. And I will honestly say, if, if that is the impact I've had on you, I really would love to meet with you. I really would, because I would really love to make it right and give Jesus a rightful, a rightful view I would love to correct your view of him 
not me, because I know what I'm capable of. But I don't want anyone to be that damaged by my behavior, my words. I really do want an opportunity to make it right and to do everything I can to help you get well from something I caused. Because I know I've done that and I hate that I've done that. I've been in roles where I just, yeah, I feel, I, I don't want anyone to sit under that and think that that's true about them, that, that my conduct was any reflection of how Jesus sees them, because it is not. That was on me. I'm going to um, put a prayer, actually, in the comments section. I, for those who would like to repent of witchcraft, I, I'm going to put, um, paste a prayer in the comments for you to declare to break agreements with the things that I addressed. I don't want to just speak on it. I want to help you be proactive and address it in your own life. So um, it's not something that you should be ashamed to confess because I, I, I just am dumbfounded at how often this was a part of my life, even as a believer. And I, I deeply regret it. So I've seen the difference in the fruit in my life since I became aware of it and started to make significant changes in how, um, how I rea how interacted with people who do this and um, my own conduct to not do it back, to not get caught in the back and forth. If people operate this way towards me, we're done. So... If I operate this way towards them, I hope they're done. There's no excuse. So I'm going to put a prayer in the comments for you to be able to come into agreement with God and, and break up this, this um, sin. Precious Lord, thank you for, you are so long tarrying. I know I say this a lot, but you have tarried with me. I know I have gone around and around and around this mountain in every which way. And of I, most of my behaviors have really, um, I see them for what they are. And I, they, they just actually sicken me at times. I am so grateful for mercy and grace. And I thank you for giving me the ability to know the truth, however that is, that you have placed me in the lives of people who tell the truth and don't gloss over the critical pieces that are eternity things that we need to know. So thank you for allowing me the privilege of knowing the truth. Thank you for allowing us to be in a country where we can actually have a Bible where we can read a Bible, where we can talk about you, where we can pray about you and not have to be underground or persecuted openly. Help us to help us to submit to your plan for our lives individually and corporately so that whatever you have brought us together for here, that we would hit the mark, that we would be ready and that we would be that we would be ready and surrendered and dead to self, that we would be there when you call us to step up. We want to serve you, Jesus. We want to build your kingdom. We want to love people. We want to honor people. And for however any of us got here, we know your hand played a big part in that. Thank you for freeing us from whatever it was that kept us away from you building something. Help us to be good to each other. Help us to passionately desire you above all things. And thank you for your forgiveness for all the times that we have forgotten the value of a person up against our own desires. We love you, Jesus. I ask this all in your precious name. Amen.